Hello, everyone, and welcome today's, to today's community conversation. We will be getting started in just a moment or two. Uh, we still have folks that are signing into the webinar right now as we speak. So we'll just give another moment or so to get everybody and then we'll begin. Thanks for joining us today. Hi again, and thank you all for joining today's community conversation. We still have a few more people getting signed in, so we're just going to wait another minute and uh, then we'll get started. So I'll just ask everybody if they're on the call uh, to make sure you're muted. Uh, we do have about 25 participants on the call right now. Things are going to get a little a little loud if, if folks aren't on mute. So uh, please take a moment just to make sure you are muted. Okay, uh, we do still have a couple of people joining, but in the interest of time, uh, we should get started. Uh, my name is Jeff Feldman. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications here at NASW New Jersey, and I am extremely happy uh, to be here today to present what should be a fascinating uh, community conversation entitled To Protect and Serve, Investing in Public Safety Beyond Policing. Uh, we are here today with uh, Marlena Ubel, MSW, who is a policy analyst at New Jersey Policy Perspective. And uh, Marlena is going to tell you uh, a little bit about the uh, research that she recently published and, uh, and about some of the ways that we can uh, move towards alternatives to policing here in New Jersey. Uh, before we start, I just do want to remind everybody that you signed a code of conduct when you registered for the event. Uh, and we do ask you to uh, be professional during the event in any communications, whether they be in the chat or uh, verbally, if we allow people to unmute uh, and just uh, make sure that uh, you you realize that if uh, if somebody does behave inappropriately, that uh, we do have the ability to uh, remove people from the webinar if that becomes necessary. Um, if you have questions, you can post them for Marlena in the chat box uh, here. And uh, hopefully, uh, given the number of participants, we will hopefully be able to uh, open up and allow people to ask uh, Marlena questions directly. But uh, again, feel free to place them in the chat as well. So with that said, uh, I'm really happy to turn things over to Marlena and uh, let's take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. As an MSW, it's really exciting to be able to come back to my roots and present here at the National Association of Social Workers New Jersey chapter. I'm really excited about that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen because I did make some slides that are really just intended to 
serve as sort of a guide for this conversation. Um, so here's a basic outline of how I anticipate this to go. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the report came to be, including some of the research methods that were involved. And then I'm gonna talk about what I found, the report findings, the relevance to social work, right? Because that's why we're all here. And then some action steps we can take as social workers and as citizens. And then we can uh, have some time for Q and A. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the creation of the report. Um, so I wanted to start with having uh, mentioning uh, the, the importance of strong community-based partnerships. And this is something that is important not only to social workers, but also to my work as a policy analyst at NJPP, because my report talks about communities that have been historically underserved or harmed, specifically Black communities. That's really the focus of the report, right? And I cannot speak to that without having strong ties to these communities themselves. So this report actually came out of a partnership between New Jersey Policy Perspective and Salvation and Social Justice. And if you're unfamiliar with Salvation and Social Justice, it is a Black-led, faith-based organization. Um, the incredible Reverend Boyer heads it, and they advocate for all kinds of social justice-based policy change. And this was really a report that they wanted to see. So that uh, really helped inform my research, right? And every step of the way, I was in touch with Salvation Social Justice and their community partnerships, right? They're very grassroots. So they have strong ties to the communities that I mention in the report. Um, another key component is asking questions of outside experts, right? So this <laughs> municipal budget documents are incredibly difficult, right? And I, even as someone that has experience with budgets and long, difficult texts, they can be confusing, difficult to understand. Um, so it was important for me to reach out to others that are experienced, city clerks, academics that research municipal budgets and have their input um, into what I was looking at. So I spent about a year total poring over uh, municipal budget documents. Um, I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I used census data. I used American Community Survey data used uh, FBI crime reporting data, and I analyzed all this data, adjusted every number in the report is adjusted to $2021. So all of my comparisons um, are like comparing apples to apples. Um, all of this was involved in the year long process. And I also wanted to mention that NJPP has a very rigorous publication process. And what I mean by that is, before the report is released to the public, it spends a great deal of time um, being fact-checked by all of our analysts, right? All of whom have graduate level degrees, right? And have a lot of experience in research. So they're checking every claim in the report. It also changes hands uh, with outside organizations, our partners, the community-based partnerships I mentioned before. Everyone kind of gets to look at it and make sure that it aligns with all of our priorities, but also that it's accurate. Okay, so now let's get into some of the findings. Um, so I start the report really by talking about the history of policing, right? The history of policing in this country um, is based on racist and class-based policymaking, right? So even if policing itself or police themselves are not racist or problematic in any way, the system, because of the way that it was uh, founded and then structured, sort of is by its nature um, perpetuating racist and classist um, policies, right? And you can see that here in the, in the data that it continues, right? And I'm gonna make a note about this data. Um, you'll notice that some of it is 2019, some of it is 2020, and some of it is 2021. All the data in the report is the most recent comprehensive data that was available. So that's the reason for the difference in years. So you'll see that 
in 2019, um, over 40% of drug violations, like arrests for drug violations were of black New Jerseyans um, compared to a population of about 15%, right? So this is incredibly dis disparate. Um, the same holds for incarceration rates, right? This is absolutely shocking to me. I don't know who it wouldn't shock, right? That 61% as of the beginning of 2021 of our incarcerated population in New Jersey are black, right? 61% is incredibly high. Um, and then this is another terribly shocking statistic. Almost half of all New Jerseyans killed by police since 2015. It goes from, my data goes from 2015 to about April, May of 2021 um, are black, right? Almost half. And this is a problem in the state of New Jersey that is actually almost unique to our state. Uh, we have the worst statistics in the country when it comes to black, white disparities and in incarceration. And I think we're third uh, for police violence, right? Police killing. So I wanna mention that New Jersey often gets credited for having relatively low um, rates of police killing compared to other states in the country, right? Um, we have, so New Jersey has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. This, you can speculate about why police are less likely to kill civilians in our state than in other states. That aside, uh, we have some of the highest disparities among those that are, that find themselves victims of police violence, right? Um, this is, this is a huge issue and something that we should be talking about and thinking about. And I think, you know, is evidence that our system of policing has some serious problems and causes serious harm. And I will mention here too, that, you know, black people are not the only people that are harmed by policing, right? We have, there's, if you are someone who is either, um, who shows symptoms of mental illness, you are more likely to experience police force. If you're someone who uses substances, you're more likely to experience police force and police killing. Um, there, uh, so about 14, so this is 86 individuals were killed by police since 2015. About 14 of them were showing, were documented as showing um, symptoms of mental illness at the time. Okay, so I've kind of laid the groundwork here that um, policing as a system that doesn't work for everyone, right? Uh, policing actively harms certain communities over other communities. There has to be a better way. Budgets, we're gonna get into budgets. Budgets are moral documents. They show us what our priorities are, where we're making investments. Um, we have chosen to invest in this system. So I look at in the report, I analyze the city of Elizabeth, and then I look at Gloucester County. Gloucester County is about 24 municipalities, and I also look at the county sheriff. Starting with Elizabeth here, it's a little bit of a more in-depth analysis because it is a city versus a county. Um, and you'll notice that Elizabeth invests in policing, uh, its investments way outpace its investments in health and human services. And we know as social workers that the reasons for crime, the reasons for violence, um, the things that maybe make our communities less safe are complicated, right? We have person and environment perspective here. Uh, we know that investments in health and human services can actually increase public safety without any of the negative consequences that I've laid out without those human costs um, of policing. So I'm making the case here that we are over investing in policing and under investing in the Department of Health and Human Services. And you'll see here that, um, you know, it's outpaced in Elizabeth and you'll notice that from fiscal year 2020 to fiscal year 2021, 
um, Elizabeth not only increased their investment in policing by about uh, over $2 million, they actually decreased their investment in health and human services by over $400,000. Um, and this is you know, during a health crisis, right? And then these, these charts on the side, what I'm trying to show here is that the police budget is not the whole picture. It's not the whole economic cost of policing. So, you know, this bottom line here, um, these light blue bars, that's only the police budget as it's listed in the municipal budget document. And that does not include any payments the municipality makes for pensions to police officers. It does not include health benefits that they pay for police officers. It does not include any taxes the municipality pays on their employment. It also does not include grants that the municipality will receive that will go to police, right? There's different grants that the state um, and federal government give to police departments, um, drunk driving enforcement, driving while intoxicated, body armor. These are some of the grants that you'll see on the right. Um, a lot of them go to paying for overtime enforcement. Um, there's like ticket writing, campaigns, all of that money goes back to these police departments and is not captured in the budget. And then the last thing I'll mention here on this slide is the burn grant. I don't know, you may or may not be familiar with this grant, but it is in a drug war era police grant. So it's federal. And basically this grant is the one that is credited for most like of these big equipment acquisitions, right? Like the, the most problematic expenditures by police. Um, and we don't really know exactly how police departments spend that money. That's not broken down in a municipal budget document. But just keep in mind that when you see a police budget, right? So the police budget for fiscal year 2021 for Elizabeth was $52 million. But if you include uh, the pension, the health benefits, the taxes that the municipality pays for those officers, it's almost $70 million, right? So it's like almost $20 million uh, increase. And then I looked at Gloucester County and in Gloucester County, you'll notice that it's pretty much the same story, right? It's a less detailed breakdown because like I said, we're talking about 24 municipalities here, uh, plus a county sheriff's office. So this is just an average across this is like the you know total police money spent across the county and the total health and human services money spent across the county um, compared. And you'll notice that it follows a trend, right? There's way more investment in policing than there is in health and human services. And I pulled out a few different places to look at. So this is just, um, the way I chose these was these are the communities that uh, spend the largest share, right? The greatest percentage of their budget on policing. So you'll notice that in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, um, funding for policing increases while funding for health and human services decreases from year to year. And this is per capita. Um, expenditures. And the reason that I did that is because it's a little bit easier to compare per capita spending when you're talking about health and human services, just because there's a lot of um, social programs and federal dollars that can come in that can sometimes not get captured if you're just comparing um, municipal budgets. So anyway, it, wh what it shows is that per capita, so per person in Glassboro, the spending right now is almost $300 on police and health and human services is just under $2, uh, huge difference. Okay, I'm going to move on now um, and talk about the relevance to this report for social work. I'm moving a little quickly, I understand that. I wanna leave a lot of time for questions um, so that we can expand on anything that I talked about. Uh, so 
I think that this report, and in fact, all of the work I do at New Jersey Policy Perspective is incredibly relevant to my um, degree as a social worker. Um, the NASW Code of Ethics, I believe, uh, firmly believe, compels us to do this work. It compels us to think big picture, right? And to advocate for communities that we serve, right? And these communities are communities that have been historically underinvested in or harmed, right? So this includes communities of color. It includes people that um, have symptoms of mental illness and includes people that use substances, right? People that are economically disadvantaged. And all of these populations are also the populations that are most at risk for interaction with the criminal justice system. There are populations that are most at risk for police force. Um, so by advocating for changing these policies, by advocating for investments in health and human services and alternative models to policing, we are in essence living up to our core values as social workers. Um, and, you know, in this conversation, Specifically, social workers actually have um, a really clear role, right? There are people talking right now about why social workers should be the ones interacting, the first people interacting um, when there's a mental health crisis, right? Why should their social workers should be the ones um, really responding to these social problems, right? Not armed police officers, right? Um, and because we have a role in this conversation, I believe we have power here. I can't tell you how many times I've been approached by policymakers, legislators, right, who see MSW by my name and say, what do you think about this, right? Because I, I do have some expertise. Um, and not to mention, this is an opportunity for us professionally, right? We are talking about investments in health and human services for communities and for states, right? And this is an expansion of the work that we do, right? We belong uh, not only at the table in policymaking, but we work in health and human services, right? So um, all the way around, I think this is really important for us. Hey Marlene, so, I just want to take a second to uh, acknowledge a comment that uh, Jessica put in the chat, just because oh, it's yeah. relevant to what you were just speaking about. Um, Jessica shares that we need to keep in mind that putting social workers in police departments or funding co-responder programs as partnerships between police and mental health professionals diverts more money to the budgets of police departments. Uh, Jessica puts forth that as helping professionals, our services should be set apart separate from law enforcement rather than couched within law enforcement. Yeah, so I do want to address that. And actually, I can I can address that right now. Um, so personally, not speaking on behalf of NJPP and not speaking on behalf of the people whom I worked on this report with, I absolutely agree 100%, right? I believe that we should have responses that are completely and totally separate from law enforcement um, and that we should be diverting funding. I think that's a great idea, but I have to say that while doing this work and speaking to communities, so part of what was involved in these partnerships was um, what they call community listening sessions, right? So different people from Gloucester County and Elizabeth and all these different groups um, that I talk about or the communities that I, the budgets I analyze rather in the report came to like give their ideas, say what they thought, what they believed and what they wanted. And the truth of the matter is that while there were some communities that said, yeah, I don't want any police coming, there were others that said, I want co-responder. That is what we want. That is what we feel is best for our community. I am not in a position to be prescriptive about what certain communities sh should or should not have. I think that the most important part here and the big takeaway is that we should be giving the power to communities to make these choices for themselves. If they want co-responder models, they should be able to have that. And if they don't, then they should be able to have that as well. Um, so that's what I'll say to that. Um, now, 
uh, some calls to action. So there is some legislation floating around right now that is related. It's not um, exactly the same about what I'm talking about when I talk about alternative models to policing, but, um, and I'm sure Jeff will share these slides, but the 988 legislation, I don't know how many of you are familiar with 988. It is a federal initiative and it's basically a number that can be called instead of 911. And the uh, operators are trained to respond to certain crises and divert calls to behavioral health professionals or mobile crisis response teams that are alternatives to police. Um, and so this is a piece of legislation that is basically calling for that infrastructure in the state of New Jersey. And it has some suggestions about what those crisis response teams should look like and how to fund this system. So I encourage you to look at this. And if you have input, if you have comments, if you have thoughts, you should definitely contact the sponsors of this bill. You should pay attention to it. Um, provide feedback to committee because they do listen and your voice does matter. So keep tabs on it. Um, the second piece is a domestic violence response team. So we have this already in New Jersey, but as it's structured right now, police officers are the ones that make the decision about whether or not to call in the domestic violence response team to cases of domestic violence or sexual assault. And what we're seeing is that almost all the time they decide not to call. So this legislation really makes it almost a requirement that if it is a case of domestic violence or sexual assault that the police are required to call in these uh, domestic violence response teams which are people that are trained in how to deal with these kinds of sensitive issues um, rather than police. Uh, and then, so I'd encourage you to do the same, look at this piece of legislation, you know, your thoughts matter. Um, then the next piece is to sign on to the Make the Right Call campaign. This is Salvation and Social Justice's campaign. They are asking for alternative models to policing uh, in the state of New Jersey. So sign up, uh, support that, uh, pay attention to what they have going on there. And then the last piece is, well, second to last piece is uh, New Jersey Communities for Accountable Policing. This is a coalition that um, New Jersey Policy Perspective is a part of, and it's being spearheaded by the ACLU of New Jersey. They have a lot of legislation on the table that is essentially um, really to rein in police power and really reform policing in New Jersey. It's a little bit different than alternative models, right? It's a bit separate, but it includes, they're advocating for increased police transparency. They are advocating for community, um, sorry, civilian uh, response um, boards, CCRBs. Um, they're, the board, essentially it's a board that will handle complaints against police officers. So it takes it outside of police departments, right? And gives it to communities um, to decide whether or not what discipline should be taken um, among a host of other pieces of legislation right now. So I encourage you to follow them and pay attention to what they have going on there um, and use your voice. Uh, you know, you have expertise, you have experience and your voice is really important in this conversation. So please speak up. And that includes right now because it is time for Q and A. Um, so I'm actually gonna stop sharing because I wanna see everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation, Marlena. That was, that was really wonderful. Uh, if you have questions for Marlena, you can put them in the chat. And I see we have a couple of comments in there already. Uh, also, I think we have a uh, few enough people on this call that if you would like to speak directly with Marlena, you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll ask you to unmute uh, so you can ask your question directly. Uh, but starting off with uh, some of the comments in the chat already, uh, Julie is asking, what are your thoughts about calling out people to work with the person perpetrating domestic violence, uh, provided it is safe? What are my thoughts? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, um, I don't know. Julie, do you want to come on and maybe uh, explain a little bit more about the question you're asking? 
Sure, thank you so much. And Marlena, fabulous presentation. Um, I was wondering, because I do work in domestic violence and uh, my focus has been working with people who have caused hurt and harm, and our DVRT program focuses obviously on the, on the victim and rightfully so, but is there space um, where there could be somebody coming out, motivating that person to get the help they need and um, just having that converse and interaction with them in that crisis moment. So was wondering your thoughts about that. Absolutely, 100%. So this is again, personally speaking. So part of my clinical work, I actually spent a lot of time, uh, my main focus was working with per perpetrators of domestic violence. So right, I helped, I did um, counseling and group, group work with these individuals. Um, and I absolutely believe that the system is is designed in a way that is, you know, too involved, right? It's too, too, we immediately um, get police and courts involved in these situations. And I think that that is in inappropriate in the same way that it's inappropriate that we get police and courts involved in, in families uh, too quickly, right? So I think there's plenty of space um, for those that cause harm to receive different kinds of treatment. Now, I do also think that um, it's a matter of degrees, right? There's definitely cases <sighs> where the, the we need somebody there that can um, subdue or separate or um, take these and remove these individuals from the situation. But yes. Provided that it is safe, I think they also have um, their space for that. Did that answer your question, Julie? Okay, great. Um, Britt also submitted a comment uh, in relation to DBRT. Uh, she says in New Jersey, the victim must be asked if they want to speak with the DVRT, the officer isn't the one who makes the decisions. So just a, oh, yes. a bit of a clarification, yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, this is not. This is my. That is not my research. My uh, what I understand from partners that are working with this is that they often are not asked. Right, it doesn't come up. Whether or not I find that I personally can't verify that, but that is just my understanding. Thanks, Marlena. Um, Razia submitted a question privately. Uh, Razia, do you want to come on and ask your question? Sure. So my question was, uh, from what I gathered from the presentation, is there like a third party, is there any third known third party information for the New Jerseyans, I believe they're called? Um, like if there is a mental health crisis that they need assistance with without calling like 911, or if there's like a family crisis that they need assistance with without calling 911 that is public um, knowledge? So yeah, I think it really depends on where you live. Um, that we do have, and this is something that not everyone knows about, but we do actually have a system for juveniles uh, in place already that looks like what we're asking for for adults for alternative models to policing. So if a juvenile is having some a crisis, there are there is a number that can be called where, yeah, um, these services will come out. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that kind of same system for adults, right? And there are places that have better systems in the state than other places. But um, what we really need is a more expansive investment, I think, in these kinds of services, right? We, and also not just alternative models to policing, because, you know, you can have as many different people responding to crises as you like, really to get to, at the root of these issues, we need to invest in communities, right? We need to invest in, you know, restoration, education, housing, right? I believe that this is a, a whole picture issue um, and get at the root of some of these social issues before we're just put responding to crises. 
Yeah, and Lynn is noting in the chat, um, I believe every county has a PEST line, a psychiatric emergency screening services line uh, that people can call uh, as an alternative to 911 if there's a psychiatric emergency. Uh, yeah, Lynn goes on to say there's a PEST number for each county. Some will come to you for help. Uh, some will come to your help. Most include police. And many times police uh, arrive first before the mental health responders uh, arrive. Lynn, I don't know if there's anything else you want to come on to add or if you uh, have any any question related to that for Marlena. No, I was just responding to the question and and yeah, we I work for NAMI New Jersey. We do encourage our families to call the psychiatric, you know, when it's a mental health situation, to call this number first. Many times the response is just better than, you know, a solely a police response. But again, like, you know, Melina said, it depends where you live. The response is better in certain counties than others. Thanks, Lynn. And uh, L. Parker is saying mobile response 877-652-7624. I don't know if that's for a specific county or statewide. Uh, if you want to put any more clarification that you have in the chat, you can do that, uh, L. Parker. And then I see uh, Jessica has her hand up. Jessica, do you want to unmute? Um, yeah, I work for the New Jersey Children's System of Care. I'm with the um, Burlington County Care Management Organization. And all my opinions here are my own, but I can add clarification for, um, in terms of like an emergency juvenile response, um, even though this system of care is statewide, there really is no emergency safety concern response. Mobile response um, can come out to homes, but it may be a few hours before they're able to dispatch somebody. They will often say if, if there is an active um, unsafe situation, if the child is, is physically aggressive or something, they will often not come. They'll say, call police. So I think sometimes we, we hear about these services that exist and think, oh, that's what they do. But in reality, it, it isn't a crisis response system. And um, the psychiatric screening services are great. They're doing telehealth now. They're coming to the homes. However, they also are not able to come immediately. It's, it's usually a delay. So for mobile response, um, and that's, that's the same number as calling perform care, I think even on their recording, they will say, if this is an emergency <laughs> or if you need police, call 911. Um, and that's a great way to get kids connected to services more long-term, but it's not something that um, is going to necessarily happen within the hour that somebody's gonna come to your home. And like I said, they will not come in many cases if there's a safety concern. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, apologies if I if I butcher the name. Uh, Vandika Vandeka has her hand up. Hi, um, Vandika. Vandika, uh, hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for hosting the event to NSW, and also thank you, Marlena, for the information. That's very helpful to continue the works. My question um, is going to be, what are your thoughts? It can be a, a personal opinion question on increasing representation within the policing system and how that may be um, beneficial or have a causal effect in terms of that kind of advocacy, along with everything else that you've said to support um, implementations. Yeah, so I think that um, this is a question I get asked a lot, and I think it's important because there is certainly data that suggests that like police officers who are women or police officers who, of color are way less likely to engage in some of these um, behaviors that we're most concerned about, right? Like excessive use of force, police killing. Um, so yeah, I definitely think there's a space for that, but I do want to say that um, like I said before, I really think this is a hyper local conversation, right? This is a community's first conversation. And I don't ever want to be prescriptive about what I think each, you know, just like each D Department of Health and Human Service, each service we provide needs to be centered around the people we're providing the services to police departments and crisis responses and the way that we do these things needs to be centered around these communities and they should have input. So 
if there are folks that are affected that live in communities that say, hey, what we would like is more representation on our police force, we should entertain that, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. In terms of like, you know, policy introductions and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the heart. Okay. I just want to say this is a very challenging part about this conversation is that police departments are hyper local, right? So like statewide policy um, in terms of police departments is never going to be too overly prescriptive, right? We're going to have different things going on in different um, municipalities. But f as far as the statewide piece goes, we can certainly advocate for um, more funding for pilot programs. That's one of the things that we're, we're talking about, right? It's like grant program for pilots, for pilot mobile crisis response teams in certain communities. This is a, something that I think would not be challenging to do, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat. Uh, while we're looking to see who else uh, may want to come online here, uh, I, I do have a question uh, for you, Marlena, because uh, I, I want to just follow up again on what you've mentioned a couple of times now about the self-determination piece and just how important it is for the communities to have a say in, in what kind of services are being provided in their communities and, and how those services are provided because really what you're, you're looking at in so many of these instances uh, of, of over-policing, for lack of a better word, and conflicts that are happening between police and community members is that, is that you're looking at power differentials and really giving the communities the ability to determine um, how policing is done in their communities and how services are provided in their communities really does a lot to, to address that power differential. And along those lines, I'm just wondering if you can share a little more maybe in the methodology realm about the type of uh, work that Salvation and Social Justice is doing within communities and like how they went about collecting information and finding out uh, what type of services communities were interested in. Yeah, happy to. So Salvation and Social Justice, again, I cannot say enough good things about them. They're an amazing organization. Um, they, so there, um, Reverend Boyer is the founder and he right now is at the uh, AME Church in Trenton, but beforehand he was working um, further south in South Jersey. And he has, um, the organization has uh, members in all parts of New Jersey, but primarily South Jersey, Trenton and Elizabeth Newark. Um, which is part of the reason that these were the communities we looked at just because that's where the membership was. Um, and basically what they did was they, he already has strong ties to different community groups. So in each place, he had used those connections to recruit people to come and give their in, you know, private, right? These are confidential conversations. Um, of which I was able to participate um, most of the time to come and like talk about their experiences with police officers. Um, they, you know, what they felt like their community was lacking, how they thought the system could be better. And the people included were youth. So there were teenagers, there were people that worked for um, health and human services departments and organizations, nonprofits in the area, right? And then there were also representatives from the NAACP, um, Salvation and Social Justice and other act, um, advocacy organizations, and then just community members that wanted to participate, um, but most of, and also people that were impacted directly uh, by police violence or substance use. Um, and so it was like a great group. They did a really fantastic job of finding a diversity of candidates and people that wanted to share. Um, and so, yeah, so what they found was that different communities wanted different things, right? I can share that in Elizabeth, they don't want police response at all. Like that, that session and those groups decided that they want something completely separate 
they don't want police involved at all when they when they are making these crisis calls. Um, and then there were some groups in other places in Gloucester County that were like, no, we feel that very strongly that it should be a co-responder model. So yeah, that's a little bit. Does that fully answer your question, Jeff? Sorry, I was on mute. No, that definitely helps. I was just curious to see who was involved in those discussions and and uh, and what they entailed. Um, do you, or does NJPP in general, do you have plans for follow-up research uh, on this project? And, and what where do you see things going from here? Yeah, so uh, we definitely want to remain involved, right? So like I said, there, we're talking about and thinking about legislation for a grant program for um, pilot models uh, for alternatives to police, like pilot crisis response teams. Um, we also, um, in addition to the Make the Right Call campaign, we're involved in the Abolish the Drug War campaign, which is, you know, talks a lot about the criminalization of, of substance use, and that is definitely deeply related to this work. Um, and so we're continuing work on that as well. And then well, I have additional research and data that didn't make it into this report. Um, that we're planning to use in the future. It centered around um, just how many people, how many officers are employed in the state versus how many social workers, counselors, crisis response, all these different um, individuals who may be able to better respond to certain, to certain uh, calls for assistance. Um, and there's also a lot, <laughs> there's a ton of stuff that I didn't get to go over in this presentation, um, you know, it's, there's a, a lot of data, a lot of research. Uh, I tried to cover, hit the main points, but uh, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff. So I encourage you to read the report and reach out to me with any questions too. Yeah, I did uh, put the link to the full report in the chat. And if you're able to share your slides after this, uh, webinar, we can send out the slides as well as with links again to that information uh, so people can view the full report. And I also just in the chat put the link to the Make the Call campaign uh, from Salvation and Social Justice. So anybody interested uh, can learn more about that and sign up to join that campaign. Uh, there was one other piece you mentioned uh, that I don't think I have the information on. Uh, it was a coalition that NJPP was involved in about community alternatives. Can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, the coalition is actually a police reform coalition. So it's uh, spearheaded by the ACLU and it has a ton of um, buy-in from all kinds of other organizations. And it's basically, they're just calling for some pieces of legislation. Um, I can actually drop I put it in the presentation, but I will just drop um, the link to it in the chat really quick into their, um, what their priorities are. Yeah, if you have that for a link, that would be great. And then I can also, uh, I'll drop that in the Facebook uh, comments as well for anybody who's watching this program on Facebook. So that'll be there in the comments. Yeah. I also wanna say that there are already communities and places that are having some success with alternative models to police. I'm sure by now everyone has heard a great deal about CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. Um, that has had, so they've had some success over the years, right? They're an older group. They came about, I believe in the seventies, maybe early eighties. Um, and they respond to a lot of calls, they divert large number of calls from their police department. Um, and they're, it's basically, the team is usually two individuals, a mental health professional um, is required to be one of those individuals and a peer responder. I don't think I mentioned this, that peer responders are a big part of this, right? We wanna make sure that at least one person responding to the scene is a certified peer. So I'm sure most of you know what that means, but for those that may not, somebody that has had experience either with substance use or 
um, incarceration or somebody that can relate to the person that is going through the crisis and then is also certified in like trained to deal with these crises at the same time, right? So that's important. Um, and then also, and then Denver too, there's an, a, a team there, STAR, they've had some success already responding to calls. So it's not like there aren't um, places where it's working. And they're in, highlighted in the report as well. And Newark Community Street Team also has a great success. They're a violence interruption program made up of community members, right, that will come um, you know, prevent and interrupt violence and respond instead of police. Yeah, and I, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the, the CAHOOTS program, uh, I just dropped a link to an article I just found online in the chat for anybody interested in learning more about CAHOOTS. Um, and Hannah, you, you uh, Hannah has just jumped in and taken my steam <laughs> in the chat as Hannah notes that South Orange has also just started a community uh, care and justice initiative. Uh, that's quite all right, Hannah. If you have specific information about that program you wanna share, you're welcome to unmute. I was just going to ask Marlena um, if she had information and had been in touch with the folks that are doing the work in South Orange. Also, there's programs that we're aware of that are going on uh, in Bloomfield, uh, where there are a couple of social workers who are working with the uh, police department in Bloomfield to co-locate some services. And there's also uh, a large program uh, underway being uh, run by a social worker in Newark. So uh, there's there's stuff that is going on in state as well as uh, CAHOOTS and the STAR program uh, in other states. So, um, oh, and Hannah shared a link to the information uh, about the Community Care and Justice Initiative in South Orange. Other questions or comments from Marlena? We have uh, a little bit of time left. Yes, thank you, Jessica. They're really great. Yes. Jessica mentions the Patterson Healing Collective. Uh, yeah, there's there's so much work being done around the state in, in so many communities. And, and as Marlena said, you know, it's, it's not something that can really be a, a state specific mandated program that's just sent down to every municipality. It really, really is hyper local. So I'm looking forward to learning more about legislation that would that would uh, create these grant programs and pilot programs and opportunities uh, so that more communities have an opportunity to undertake this work. Um, I, I'm also wondering if there's any work being done within the state, maybe to identify best practices through programs like Cahoots or STAR or any other uh, programs that are in existence in other states right now that maybe we could provide to communities almost like a starter kit so they, they have some models to look at and things to consider uh, when they're looking at uh, creating programs like this in their communities. Yeah, I think that's going to be a really important piece of all of this, Jeff. Um, you know, the, we do have, while we do have some to look at, like CAHOOTS, we, Salvation Social Justice in these visiting, visioning sessions also undertook the work to kind of come together with a list of what they thought best practices would look like. Um, and I think that, you know, it's complicated because if we do, if we ask every community to do this, this is very labor intensive, right? Like we can't really expect that the people that are being most harmed by these systems are also gonna be able to come together and dedicate so much time, so much of their time to telling us what they need, right? So it has to be a balance, I think, of um, looking to what's been done before, listening to some of the folks that have been able to dedicate that time and just trying to, implement and see what works best. I think that we have a tendency to not evaluate the systems that exist now, like policing, like we don't hold it to the same standard that we wanna hold these alternative crisis response teams to, right? Like if their stats included killing as many people as the police have killed over the last five years, we probably, you know, wouldn't fund them. So. 
I think that we, there might be some, uh, you know, um, program evaluations that will have to take place, right? But they'll, I think will have to happen at least a year or so after these pilot programs get a chance to try to do the work. Thanks, Marlena. So I'm gonna dig into my clinical bag of tricks for a short moment and we're gonna use silence for 30 seconds or so just to see if there are any other questions that may come up with some quiet. So I will uh, sit back for a moment. Sorry, I didn't want the timer to run out while I tried to find <laughs> the function of how to raise my hand. Um, no, please yeah, go ahead, Slater. I don't know if you noticed it in your data. I didn't want to kind of like dig in if it wasn't in the presentation, but um, I know there was a big, you know, over the, as we all know, over the past few years, there's been this big defund the police, um, you know, campaign, you know, message being, being put out there. And um, there were a few places that got popular for defunding. Um, and then, you know, recently there's been more reports of places kind of backtracking and sudden, like, because of the increased um, protests and things going on, especially around Black Lives Matter, they've been putting more money back into the police, even more so growing their budgets. Did you notice some sort of dip and then similar trend when you looked at the budgets for New Jersey? Yeah, so it looks like, um, based on my research, New Jersey was largely unaffected by this, right, as you noticed police budgets actually tended to increase um, between 2020 and 2021. School is out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so there's, you know, a lot of evidence to suggest that in this state, we haven't really seen um, any kind of defunding of police. Does that answer your question, Selena? Yes, absolutely. I know that there was a portion of your presentation where you showed um, a difference in budgets, but I didn't know how many years back. To be honest, I'm not sh exactly sure when that the you know big call for defunding started in a national spotlight, but um, that's unfortunate to, to hear, honestly. Thanks, Selena. Uh, Razia compliments you on how well you handled the children coming in as a, as a fellow mother. She she uh, applauds <laughs> how you handled that. And she didn't hear her say, ow, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and just really quickly, before we wrap, uh, Mike took the time to uh, put a comment here in the chat. Uh, thank you for the presentation. He has to jump off. Uh, Mike is the uh, it works for uh, Somerset County uh, Human Services. And Mike says, we are running a pilot funded through his department in Bridgewater, uh, the Community Police Alliance Coordinator on point uh, in Stafford Township is also worth looking at. Mike says he's a member of the AG Mental Health Special Needs Task Force Steering Committee and that it's also a significant focus of work. And if you'd like to contact Mike about his work, uh, he left his email address in the chat. Uh, so I know Mike is not here, but thank you, Mike, for, sailing, for sharing that. Uh, and Helen is also saying Camden, New Jersey, credits investing in funding in police has also tremendously helped the city. Yeah, we know that Camden uh, has been able to serve as a model for community policing uh, for several years, and they've managed to do some, some wonderful work in that community as well. Um, it's about 1258, so I think we are going to wrap, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and thank you so much, Marlena. Uh, for your research and work and for this presentation. Uh, we'll follow up with the slides via email to everybody who registered, uh, as well as a copy of the recording of this video in case you want to review it or share it with anybody. And uh, we will uh, see you all for our next community conversation soon. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Thank you. Bye.